Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, wood turning tools. Today, we'll be making an 11 16th inch spindle gouge. So most high quality wood turning tools are made from a steel known as high speed steel. Now, high speed steel is a steel which can be heated up to fairly high temperatures and retain its hardness. It's used for drill bits and things like that. The cool thing about it, and this flows out of the fact that it's so frequently used for drill bits, is that you can actually buy preheat treated M2 steel, the steel that we're gonna be using why would you want this? Well, because M2 steel is very, very tricky to heat treat and it requires quite specialized equipment. So um, the cool thing is you can go out and buy preheat treated drill rod and then you can make that, you can grind that using fairly you know, low tech grinders uh, to make a fairly sophisticated tool that's really quite comparable to the kind that are sold by Sorby and Crown and some of those other kinds of high-end uh, wood turning tool makers. Quick footnote, I'm going to be using a wide variety of steels in this video series. Let me address the obvious question, which steel is best for wood turning? Well, sadly there's no simple answer. High carbon steels like 1095 are not going to hold an edge for a super long time, but they're fairly simple to heat treat, and 1095 in particular is readily available. It's easy to sharpen, takes a nice edge, and it's cheap, and you can buy it in nearly infinite numbers of shapes and sizes. There's another steel we'll use in a later video that's called 01, which is more expensive than 1095, but is probably the easiest tool steel to heat treat. Easy is good. Another steel, D2, which we'll use in yet another later video to make a scraper, keeps a pretty good edge, but it takes some moderately sophisticated equipment to heat treat, and it's frequently sold in precision ground state, which makes it more expensive. Which leads us to the steel we'll use in this video, M2 High Speed Steel. M2, which is used by Robert Sorby, Crown, and other high quality wood turning tool makers, is a bit harder than the other steels we'll use. It's also more brittle, but you can heat it up to very high heats without burning the temper and softening the tool. The problem is, pre-hardened M2 is only available on a retail basis in fairly small sizes and specific shapes. It's also expensive relative to the other steels we'll use. The cool thing about M2, though, is you can buy it in its hardened state, already heat treated. So if you watch all these videos and decide you aren't up to fiddling around with heat treating, maybe M2 steel is the steel for you. Now M2 is used by machinists for all sorts of tools. Kind of the standard use for it is drill bits. And you can buy pre-hardened M2 in the form of drill blanks. Here in the ENCO catalog, for instance, you can buy M2 in the form of pre-hardened drill rod. If you want to be making something flat, a skew or a parting tool, say, MSC Direct sells machine lathe parting tool blanks, which are suitable for making flat tools. The drill rod that I bought is 6 inches long, which is the standard length that ENCO and most suppliers of this sort sell, and 11 sixteenths in diameter. Now, I chose the diameter somewhat randomly. I'll make some other similar tools in this series in different diameters, so I was really just looking for something different. Anyway, there are some drawbacks to M2. This blank cost me 26 bucks plus shipping. For a point of reference, by weight, that's, oh, roughly 10 times as expensive as a piece of 1095 bar stock, and again, just very roughly, 5 times as much as precision ground 01 drill rod. Additionally, it's tough to find longer pieces available in pre-hardened form, so you'll be limited to kind of stubby tools if you use pre-hardened M2. But, on the plus side, and this is not a minor thing, all we have to do is grind it, slap a handle on it, and we're done. Now, if you're already an experienced wood turner, you'll know that depending on how you grind this, you could make a spindle gouge, a bowl gouge, or whatever. So the techniques used here will be applicable to all kinds of tools if you can grind the flute in the center 
to make it fit the kind of tool you're trying to make. All right. The basic geometry of the tool we'll make will have a cross section that looks sort of like a big smile. If you buy professional gouges, they'll have somewhat deeper flutes than mine does. They mill them out using side mills or dedicated grinding tools that I don't have, but that doesn't mean this won't still work. Bear in mind that you may have to learn to use this tool slightly differently from commercial gouges. But trust me, this will make a tool that works. I've tried it and it does work. Also, you may not have the tools that I do, and so you'll have to modify your design a little to fit your grinding gizmos. If you don't have a fancy knife maker's belt grinder, you could use a bench grinder or an angle grinder, a grinding wheel mounted on a hand drill. Use your imagination and you'll figure out a way to get there. It'll go a little slower than my grinder, but you can still get there. And actually, you can do some things like bowl gouges that have much deeper flutes with those deeper sorts of grinders. Okay, here's what I'm doing. First, I'll grind a flat running about three and a half inches down the tool and about a third of the way down through the diameter of the round. This will basically be a reference or guide for my final grind. If you're using a bench grinder, you may just skip this step. Also, if you're using a bench grinder, you'll run into the big drawback of this material. It's really hard, which means you'll be busy at the grinder for quite a while. Just be patient and you'll get there. When the steel starts getting too hot to touch, just dunk it in water. Okay, once I've ground a flat roughly a third of the way through the tool, I'll switch over to a wheel and use the shape of the wheel to grind a radius which will constitute the flute. Now, if you're using a bench grinder to do this, obviously you'll be limited to the radius of your wheel. So if you've got an old wheel that's been worked down to a smaller radius, you might want to use that instead. Also, you can rotate the work 90 degrees and grind down the face of the tool to make a channel rather than cutting side to side on the grinder. Lots of possibilities. A larger radius tool will still work, but you'll end up with a tool that ultimately works a little differently on the lathe. That's not a bad thing. Different is just different. Incidentally, normally when you grind a hardened steel edge tool, you have to be very careful not to burn the edge and soften the steel. But with high-speed steel, you don't have to worry as much. The singular quality of high-speed steel is that it doesn't lose hardness even when you heat it up to red heat. Now, personally, I'm not going to test that, but that's the theory. Done. There's that smile profile I mentioned earlier. You can run this way up to a very fine grit if you want to. The higher you go, the potentially sharper the edge will be. I'll go up to 30 microns using a 3M Trizac structured abrasive belt, leaving quite a fine surface. That'll help me give a sharper cutting edge to the finished tool. Now I'll grind the relief angle of the cutting tool. If you're an experienced wood turner, you may have a Sorby grinding tool or some kind of cool grinding jig. If you do, by all means use it now and set whatever angle you're aiming for. I'm just going to freehand it. Basically, I just try to eyeball a consistent angle. I'll set the angle using a 40 grit ceramic belt, then I'll hopscotch up the grit levels. 60, 120, 220, ending up eventually with a 3M 30 micron plastic belt, which gives me a nice sharp edge. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that I was really kind of winging it as I was doing this initial grind. It's actually too steep, and I had to go back and change the tool later on. But this will give you the idea of how it works. But you'll want to get closer to about a 30 degree edge. I was probably at about 40 here and that was really too steep. You'll find various recommendations about what angle to grind. But in theory, the harder the material you'll be working, the steeper the grind. And that's that. The cutting tool is done. All we need to do now is turn the handle. We'll run through that relatively quickly. If you want to see more detail, check out the first video in this series which shows the process in a little more detail. For this handle, I'll be using Cocobolo, an oily exotic wood. I'll make it just like I did the one in the first video. Turning between centers, parting down to the measurements I want at key points along the handle, 
as well as the ferrule seat. Roughing out the curves, detail gouge for the nose and tail. Sanding. Now on this one, there's a little difference from the previous project. I'm going to go ahead and sand all the way up to a thousand grit. Cocobolo is a very hard, oily, close grain wood, similar to ebony and rosewood in its working qualities. So you can really make this stuff smooth as glass. Once I've got it all smoothed out, I'll give it a super simple finish. I'll just apply some garden variety furniture wax according to the manufacturer's directions. Just let it sit about 10 minutes and buff it out. Then I'll drill out the hole. Blew up the tool and the ferrule. Give the ferrule a little quick polish. And here's the final tool. Okay, so let's say you're a knife maker with more sophisticated heat treating equipment. The next video will show us making and heat treating a tool from a relatively fancy alloy steel. And for you wood turners, we'll have a different approach to making a handle. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades.